So we're now going to evaluate Java structured concurrency, and we're going to take a look at the, the pros and cons of this approach. So let's start by taking a look at the pros or the benefits. It's always important whenever you take a look at any technology to thoroughly and objectively weigh the pros and cons. It gives you a much better understanding of, of when to use it and when not to use it. So one of the nice things of Java structured concurrency, particularly the features having to do with the structured task scope, is it provides greater clarity about the structure of concurrent code, which, which is exactly its purpose. It's structured concurrency, so it should provide greater clarity about the structure. And this is particularly true when we compare it to traditional Java free threading designs, where you can just spawn threads willy-nilly any old time you want, and they don't have to have any parent-child relationships or sibling relationships to each other. So in particular, in this example, which we talked about briefly and we'll look at in other contexts, this example would be used to implement some kind of middle tier web service where you're going to have a request coming in from a client and you want to go out and do two things in parallel. You want to find some information about a user, some kind of user profile information about what access privileges or credentials they might have. And then you might also simultaneously want to go out and, and fetch the order that they have requested. And those two things will take place at the same time, ideally running on separate cores, so they truly do in fact run in parallel. And this whole block of code here that's called handle becomes atomic. It launches those threads, it does all the work, gets the result back, and we never have to worry about any of those computations leaking out and living beyond the scope of this method. In particular, if something goes wrong, if it turns out that the, the user wasn't authorized to make this request or this purchase, or the order that was asked for doesn't exist, or there was a problem in the network or, or whatever, then in that case, the whole process will be canceled. And that's because we use this so-called shutdown on failure model. We'll talk more about that later. Another nice thing that happens here is if the thread of the parent task is interrupted either before doing the calls or during the call to join, the fork calls that we made before, these, these two there, they will be canceled and we're going to exit and throw an exception without having to do anything else explicit. So interrupts and exception handling is, is dealt with nicely. And it's also at least arguably easier to reason about the code, read the code, because it, it looks very much like you're running in a single thread environment. You're finding the user, you're fetching the order, you're taking the results, you're making a new response. The difference, of course, is these things are actually able to run in parallel. So that's that's the nice feature that we have. We can run these things in parallel. It was before this would be run in a purely sequential way. Another nice thing about this particular model is you can use structured concurrency to support both invoke all and invoke any semantics. So invoke all semantics are the mechanism that's called shut down on success. It means run everything and when they're all done, take the results. Whereas invoke any semantics come if you want to by using shut down on failure, which means that if something throws an exception, then the first thing that finishes will be the result and you can cancel everybody else. And we'll talk more about that in the context of some case studies that we'll go over in the next class. Naturally, not everything is rainbows and unicorns, so there's some limitations or some cons with structured concurrency. One of the problems is that they require you to use futures. And that's because when you, you fork something with the structured concurrency model, you end up getting it back a future to the result because it's all gonna go off and run in parallel. And so here's an example where you going to go ahead and sort a list in parallel and then print the results. And it just gets somewhat complicated and convoluted to do this type of code, it's just ugly. You have to convert a list of future objects to a list of objects, which is ugly and a little time consuming and so on. And the other problem is you, you can't chain together futures. This is one of the well-acknowledged limitations with the Java future interface, which was designed a long time ago, pretty much 20 years ago. And they've added newer features to Java, like completable futures, to make this cleaner. We'll take a look at an, this in an example in a second. The syntax, therefore, is a bit verbose. There's try uh, with resources statements. You've got the scope stuff in there. And so it's just a little bit, a little bit 
harder to see the forest for the trees compared to using completable futures. Now, if you took my class last semester, you probably know what a completable future is. If you didn't take my class last semester, you're probably befuddled as to what I'm talking about, but completable futures can be used to give you a more streamlined way of doing asynchronous computations, although there are patterns you have to understand for that as well. So that's just a quick overview of evaluating the pros and cons of Java structured concurrency.